Hello and welcome to Engineering Open Our Stay Live and welcome to everybody out there. We're coming to you live from the Institution of Engineering and Technologies headquarters here at the IET Savoy Place London, where we're going to be giving you an insight into what it's really like to be an engineer or technologist today. I'm Mark Reynard, your host for the day, and I'm really excited to have you join us. It's a real shame that we can't have you here as a live audience in the studio due to the pandemic. But the crew in here will be making some noise, won't you guys? Brilliant. So if you want to get in touch at home, keep sending in your comments and we'll try to read out as many as possible. I hope you're ready to have your minds blown by all the inspirational guests we'll have on our show today, as well as some really cool experiments and some crazy demonstrations. I'll also be putting you and all our guests through their paces with a paper plane challenge. So make sure you have some A4 paper to hand and maybe some sort of a tape measure. Plus you'll need an adult with access to a camera and social media so you could be in with a chance of winning an amazing prize. But more to come on this later. You can also head over to our Engineering Open House Day Media Hub where you will find so many events held by companies from right across the UK. You can learn how to make an app with Apple, go on a virtual treasure hunt underground with Transport for London, learn how to code and raise Tower Bridge, or even launch a rocket with Rocket Makers Plus, and so much more. So school's out, get the popcorn out, sit back, get involved, and let's all learn about the crazy and wonderful world of STEM. So let me give you a sneak peek into what we have on today in our Engineering Open House Day Marathon. We are live with you today with five episodes, each lasting around an hour, delving into a different area of engineering and technology with all things aerospace engineering, and that's going to launch the show. And then we'll be sparking your interest with our next show, and it's going to be all about electricity. Then after that, we'll be revving those engines as we explore the world of transport engineering. Uh, before powering our brains, uh, which I need a bit of that by the look of it, um, with our energy and sustainability episode. And then we're going to finish off this jam packed live a thon with our innovation show. And we'll be seeing what the world of engineering tomorrow could bring. And joining us throughout the day, we have some engineering experts. We've got Ella Podmore, our 2020 Young Woman Engineer of the Year winner, and she's an engineer at McLaren Automotive. Jack Hesselwood, who's going to be telling us all about the history of space, and he's quite a special guy too. And we also have Ruth Amos and Sean Brown with us in the innovation episode to announce the winner of their Kids Invent Stuff competition. We also have some amazing YouTube stars with us today. So how's it going over there, Maddie and Greg? Cheers, Mark. I tell you what, yeah. what a day. Engineering Open House Day jam-packed with STEM activities. I know, I can't wait to watch Love the rest it. of the show, maybe with uh, something delicious on the side. What, a little sweet treat? I'm always up for that. Yes, join us later this afternoon because we're going to be showing you how to make your very own s'mores, delicious, using a solar-powered pizza box oven. And the best thing about this make is that you can put it together using things you'll find around the house, maybe with a bit of help from your local pizza delivery any excuse. We're also going to be taking part in the Engineering Open House Day Paper Plane Challenge. Mm. So Ella, Shrook and all the rest of the guests, we are coming for that top spot. Yeah, watch out. But are you hashtag Team Greg? Or hashtag Team Maddie? See you soon. Oh, s'mores, they're my favourites as well. That's going to be awesome. Thanks, Greg and Maddie. We'll see you shortly to help you make some delicious treats and see how that happens at home. Anyway, remember to tag us on social media with hashtag IET Open House or leave us a comment in the live chat and we'll try and give you a shout out or ask one of your questions maybe to our IET president, Danielle George, no matter how wacky. Send it in via social media and we'll have a go to see if we can answer it. And by we, not we I don't mean me, I mean Danielle George, because otherwise we won't get any answers at all. So shall we meet our quiz master now? How are you, Dan? Hi, Mark. Lovely to see you and so great to be here. And hi to everyone who's tuned in at home. Let me tell you, you are in for a great day. As Mark said, I'm Dan George. I'm the IET's 2020 president and I'm a professor of radio frequency engineering and the associate vice president at the University of Manchester. 
And like Mark said, I'm going to be here at 12.30 in the transport hour to answer all your STEM questions that other people may have not been able to answer. No pressure on me at the moment, Mark. Uh, but I'm now I'm ready to, I'm raring to go now. Have you not got any questions for me from home now? Well, I, don't you worry, Dan. I think we have got some questions for you that have already been sent in. But first, I mean, you just said like some really big words there. So can you help me in the listeners at home understand what you do as Professor of Radio Frequency Engineering and Associate Vice President, I think you said? Yep, Associate Vice President um, at the University of Manchester. So I have sort of a big leadership role at the university and that's in teaching and learning for our students. And I'm particularly interested in the sort of digital technologies that we can use to help with our teaching for our 40,000 students. Wow. Yeah. And what, what was it that got you into engineering in the first place then, Dan? Um, well, lots of people have heard me say this before, but, but I'm a massive believer that we're all born scientists because we all ask why. And then I started to ask how after a while, and then I realized that was engineering for me. So sort of the, the why is the scientist in me and the how is the engineer. I want to know how things work, not just why things work. And you said professor of radio frequency. So what on earth is that? So um, all, all radiation, all energy in the universe is on sort of a spectrum called the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's got sort of radio waves and microwaves and light and x-rays. And I use the radio part of that spectrum to look at all this naturally occurring radiation in the universe. And, and it glows at sort of radio frequencies. So I design, help design the electronics for telescopes, both space-based and ground-based, to look at all this amazing light, cosmic light that's wow. in the world. Well, bit. thanks, Dan. Now we know a bit more about you and what you do. Shall we test those engineering skills then? Um, we have a 10-year-old from uh, Hertfordshire, I believe, called Cameron, who's ready to test your knowledge. Let's have a look at this. Can helicopters fly upside down? Whoa, so can helicopters fly upside down? What a great question, Cameron. Um, Yes, they can. I mean, they're not designed to. Uh, so, so they can. And you might have seen it sort of in, a, in an air show where they do a loop de loop. Um, the, the, the rotors, the blades, are actually designed to give it sort of vertical lift, so to give it altitude and to lift it up. Um, so it's not really designed to, to be the other way around, but it can do it. It just doesn't want to do it a lot. But if the pilot's got the right momentum, the right altitude, they can do it and then get back to how it's originally wow. designed for. How cool is that? So if you have any questions, send them in. You can use IE, uh, hashtag IET Open House on social media and we'll, we'll be asking as many of your questions as we can later on. Yes, I can't wait to see what you're going to be asking me. I'm a little bit nervous as well. Uh, plus, I'm going to be co-hosting the next hour with Mark. So I shall see you then when we're going to learn all about electricity. Well, thanks, Dan. Now, let's not wait any longer as we're ready for liftoff. And in our first episode, we're going to be exploring an industry in engineering which is quite literally out of this world. Aerospace and aeronautical engineering, amazing. Aeronautical and space engineers work with aircraft and things which can fly. This can include enormous jumbo jets or even cool rockets, but they also create smaller things like satellites the size of a small table or drones that fit in your hand. I mean, just incredible. So let's find out what the difference is, shall we? So, well, to tell us all about this is Sophie Harker, and she's an aerodynamics and performance engineer, as well as an aspiring astronaut. Sophie says engineering is all about being part of a team that shares a, glow, a goal to build something amazing for the future. And through doing that, you get to leave kind of a legacy. So first, let's have a little look at a video all about Sophie. I want to be an astronaut, and when I was 19 years old, I met the first British astronaut, Dr. Helen Sharman. I asked her what I needed to do to be an astronaut, and she told me to be an engineer. The world is changing at such a rate, and technology is advancing at the fastest rate that it has ever done. The aviation industry needs to make sure that we're ready for that. We need to predict what the world is going to look like and make sure that whatever we develop now will match that. As an aerodynamics and performance engineer, I look at future concepts and work out whether they're going to fly or not. And if they do fly, how well do they fly? How far do they fly? And what can we do to make them perform better? Most of my work is theoretical, calculating before it actually flies. However, calculation only gets you so far, you also have to test. We have wind tunnels on site so that we can test models of our future concepts and work out whether we were close to our calculations. What's exciting about my job is that I am creating the future 
and I get to work on something that so few people in the world are ever going to be able to work on. One of the reasons I really enjoy engineering is because I get to leave a legacy and in a hundred years time people will look back and see what I put on this earth. Wow, and we're really lucky. She's here today with us live in the studio. A big welcome to our first engineering open house day guest, Sophie Harker. Yeah. Let's say hello, guys. Hello, Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be back at the IT. Brilliant. I mean, that was some video as well. So, so can you help the viewers at home with what the difference is first between aerospace engineering and aeronautical engineering? Because we've heard those terms both sort yeah. of in the same sentence. Yeah, and they're kind of interchangeable to, to an extent. They're very, very similar. So aeronautical is very much more planes, hot air balloons, gliders, things like that. Whereas aerospace also includes space. So it's kind of like and aeronautical is like a subpart of aerospace, is how I would describe it. But you can kind of use the both of them, really. It doesn't really matter. Too and which much. one are you? Which one are you kind of going into? Is is is, is mm. the area you're most sort of? So I say aerospace because I do work on sort of aircraft that fly in the atmosphere, and then I do work on aircraft that fly above the atmosphere in space. So I work on a few different bits and pieces. So yeah, wow. I'd say more aerospace for me. And, and what what was it? A dream as a child to become a sort of aeronautical and aerospace engineer? How did you even think of going into this? Uh, it, it wasn't at all. I did I didn't know what engineering was. I was 19 before I found out what an engineer was. And um, when I was younger, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to be everything, really. I wanted to be an athlete. I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to be everything I could be, want to be. Um, and when I was 16, I kind of realized that actually all those different bits and pieces formed the vision of an astronaut. And I was like, actually, maybe that's what I want to do. And that kind of led me into aerospace engineering through that dream. Wow. And did you have any role models when you were, when you were young then? Was it somebody yeah. who really got you kind of interested in it? And, helped you to go up that career path? Yeah, definitely. So as, as I mentioned, when I was 19 was when I found out being an engineer, um, what, what an engineer was. Um, and I met Dr. Helen Sharman, who was the first British person in space. Yeah, so I got to meet her um, and she was the first person to say, OK, engineering isn't, you know, fixing washing machines or satellites. It's not that. It's creating, it's innovating, it's making things from your brain real into real life. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, and so I kind of just tailored all my studies and everything towards that from there. And you yeah. still sound massively enthusiastic about it all. Mm. Is it something that's always been like your enthusiasm? And, and what ex still excites you most about the sort of STEM area? Yeah, so I, I think I've got, the more I know about it, the more interested I get in it. So when I first started working in aerospace, I didn't know a lot about planes absolutely nothing if I'm honest um, and I had to learn a lot about them and the more I learn the more interesting they become and I'm like okay wow so it's not just oh there's some wings and you get in the air there's, there's really clever bits of aircraft that people don't think about and that's what makes it more interesting for me but I think the main thing that gets me motivated is and as I sort of mentioned earlier is the legacy you leave you get to leave an amazing legacy that in a hundred years time people will be like oh so that's what you worked on or it will still exist and I think that's an incredible thing to be part of and there's very few jobs that let you do that and engineering does that no matter which field you're in. And, and it's really, this is really exciting. You're literally sort of aspiring to be an astronaut. That's what you <laughs> want to end up doing, isn't it, actually? And do you think, do you think it's something that you, you're going to get to? And, and what about viewers at home? How could they follow in your footsteps? Yeah, it's, it's a hard, hard thing to do. It's not an easy thing to be like, oh, I'll wake up one day, I'm going to go to space, um, unless you're Jeff Bezos or so. But um, unfortunately, you have to work quite hard for quite a long time. So um, I'm fingers crossed, I'm doing my best. So I have all the, the basic qualifications. So I have a master's degree in a STEM um, subject of sorts. Um, I have experience in, in aerospace engineering and things like that. Um, and there's other things that I'm doing in my spare time to try and help my chances. So I'm learning to fly a plane myself, wow. learning other languages, those sort of things that I'm trying just to make myself as good a candidate as possible so fingers crossed hopefully one day I'll make it up there that would be brilliant wouldn't it and and so what, what what's the most exciting thing you've worked on so far um, you know in engineering oh that's a hard question a very hard question I think one of the most exciting projects I've worked on was um, a space plane and working with space planes but from that I moved into something called hypersonics now hypersonics is something people don't really know much about and um, it's not a real thing yet really um, essentially a hypersonic aircraft is something that flies faster than five times the speed of sound so that's like 70,000 miles per hour so like a thousand times faster than where you go on a motorway so it's pretty fast wow. yeah so flying that fast causes all host a whole host of problems so not only do you need an engine that can fly <clears throat> that fast but when you're flying that fast the aircraft melts it's too wow. hot so solving all of those challenges i think that's probably one of the most exciting things i've worked yeah, on yeah brilliant <laughs>
<clears throat> well, Sophie, I mean, this is, this is an important day as well, because today we're going to set you and all the other guests and uh, all our viewers at home as well, a really special engineering open house day paper plane challenge. So viewers at home, find yourself a sheet of A4 paper. Um, and if you want to take part, make sure that you, you kind of go along with the rules. There's rules up on, on the websites and everything. But everyone will have 60 seconds on the clock to make their plane before they step up onto our engineering runway for their paper planes to take off. But first, Sophie, as an expert in aviation, can you share with us how to make <laughs> the best paper plane you can? Is there really a kind of, is there a recipe for it? Yeah, so this is a topic that I should be really good at, and I am not. I am terrible at paper airplanes, but I am very good at making actual planes. Um, and the way that we do that is coming up with lots of different designs, lots of different ideas, and then we test them in a wind tunnel. So that's what we're going to do today. And I actually made a bit of a video earlier about this, where we built a wind tunnel, which you can do at home as well, wow. um, to test your aircraft or a wing or something like that to see whether they're actually going to give you good lift. That is fantastic. So... Um, does it matter what type of paper you use? I mean, if you use thicker paper, mm -hmm. does it is does that going to make a difference? It definitely makes a difference, yeah. So um, something called materials engineering or material science is very important in aviation. We need to make sure that our aircraft are going to go through the air quite nicely. Um, so it definitely makes a difference. It makes a difference on how heavy it is. It makes a difference on how smooth it will fly through the air. Lots of things. So you could try it with all sorts of different pieces of paper and see what happens. Fantastic. Well, I think I've got a bit of a video about this now. So let's have a quick look at that then. So let's build a window. Tunnel. So we've got a few bits and pieces that you should be able to find around the house. So we've got a hairdryer, we have some digital kitchen scales, not bathroom, they might be a bit big, um, some cardboard, uh, some clear, clear plastic to make a window, that's quite a hard thing to find, um, empty yoghurt pots, make sure you clean them first, um, a pen, cocktail stick, um, we need lots of sellotape, scissors, make sure you have an adult with you as well for those, um, and some mesh. So this mesh can be kind of anything you really want. Um, it can be some lace or it can be the sticky stuff that we've got here. Just something that air can pass through. That's your main thing you need there. And then the big thing, the main thing you need, a box. So you can have any kind of box you want. Um, this one's quite big as you can see, so we are going to make it a bit smaller. If you've got a lid, take the lid off, throw it away. You don't need that. Try not to hit anybody with the lid though. Then, if you've got a box like this, where you've got the sides like, oh, can't bend it, like so, you're going to rip those sides off and you're going to get rid of those. You've only you've got a box with all the sides but one, one open. So, once you have your box like this, the next thing you're going to do is start marking out where you're going to cut the holes. So, this is where you grab your pen. You're going to mark a nice big window on the front. So, it doesn't matter, too big, but make sure that this piece of clear plastic can fit over that window. That's the main thing you need to focus on there. On one side, you then need to do another exit square there. It doesn't really matter how big it is, just as long as it's got a good chunk of, of air can come out of it. And then on the other side, this is when you need your hairdryer. So, I'm just flip this over. Put your hairdryer on top, draw a circle around your hairdryer. I won't do it now because we haven't got much time today. Um, and then you cut out that circle there. So you've got three holes to cut. You've got a circle here, window on the front, box on the side. So for time, here's one I did earlier. We've cut one out. So here's our main wind tunnel here. So we have the main window on the front, big gap here. Exit on the, nope, I lie. Hair dryer on the side here, and then exit window on the side here. So now the first thing you can do here is create our window. So we take our clear bit of plastic, I will try and do this as best I can in front of the camera. It's a bit awkward. Get your tape, tape it down. As simple as that. Make sure you tape all four sides of your window. Try and make it as airtight as you can. You should see there a nice window. So you've got a window here with the plastic and then inside you've got the tape on each side. So that's your window, that's your first one. Second thing we're going to do is the exit. So in a real wing tunnel we have big bits of mesh that stop things from flying around so that we don't accidentally hit anything with our, when we've got lots of wind flying through. So this is what this is going to do. It's going to catch anything that may come out of the wind tunnel so we don't lose, lose our wings or lose our aircraft. So, this stuff is nice and easy because it's nice and sticky. If I just cut it apart like this, 
Um, but if you've just got a bit of lace, something like that, you can just stick it on with a bit of sellotape and you can just stick it on underneath there. Da, da, da. So we'll just do a couple pieces, make sure it's fully covered. Doesn't have to be perfect. Da, da, da. And that's our mesh covered. So that's our exit hole there. So that's where the air is going to come out. And that is our wind tunnel pretty much done. So that's the tunnel. So now we need to work out how we're actually going to test something in the tunnel. So this is where it gets a bit more tricky. So we need our yogurt pots and we need our cocktail sticks, which I have one here. And you need to jam your cocktail stick into your yogurt pot. I warn you now, this is not as easy as it looks and you really have to push hard. So you might want to get a grown up to help you with this as well as the cutting. So push through and you should be able to get a little yogurt pot stand with a cocktail stick on top. On top of that, you are then going to put whatever you want to test in your wind tunnel. So that could be a wing, it could be a toy aircraft, it could be anything you want to test in your wind tunnel. So we've got a few that I made earlier to play around with. So we've made them out of card, so it's quite thick, but not too thick, um, so that you've got a bit of, of uh, structure when you put it on there. And so we'll try it with the wing first, so this wing here. So this looks just like a wing of an aircraft. Um, we'll stick that on. You can, use, you can do it with tape, it's probably a bit easier with blue tack. Um, if you've got it, and you stick it on to the wing, and you stick your cocktail stick in it like so. You may go through the card a little bit, but that's okay. And that is essentially what we're going to put in our wing tunnel to see whether we can get generate any lift. We now have our object in the wind tunnel. This is where our devices come in. So we have our scales here. Make sure you turn them on before you put the wind tunnel over them. And you're going to put your wind tunnel on top. The hairdryer goes in the side. This one obviously isn't plugged in right now, but it will be plugged in when we do our test. Um, and this is essentially what your wind tunnel is. So you can put your test object in on the scales and you'll see a mass. You'll see how heavy that, that structure is. Put your hairdryer in, turn it on, and then see what happens. Let's give it a go. So Sophie's now over at our little experts area and she's actually gonna get her wind tunnel onto the table and really show us how it works. And hopefully this is all going to go perfect. It is live, so anything could happen. Um, but here we go, Sophie, yeah, show us what you're doing then, Sophie. You've got a wing there as well. I do, yes. How so, did, did you actually make the wing just out of a piece of card then? Yes, yeah, so we have lots of bits of card here, hundreds of different pieces. Um, cut them in half so you've got a bit of a smaller, smaller wing. You don't want it too big because it won't fit in your box. Um, and then you mount it on top of your, your yogurt pot like so. So you're kind of just folding it in half, creating that sort of nice curve shape. And that's Brilliant. what you can do. But you could do lots of different ones. Like we have a triangle one here to see yeah. how that would flow. And um, we have a slightly flatter, thinner one here as well. Brilliant. Um, and we also have a cylinder. Um, and this is one that people don't think would create a lot of lift, but actually out of all of them, probably creates the most lift. Wow. Yeah, so that's a really good one to try and, and have a look at. at home I mean, level. if they'd had wind tunnels back in kind of, you know, the, the days when they were making these wooden planes and <laughs> they'd have been able to see what it was like, but it was more experimentation then, I guess. Yeah, and very dangerous, very dangerous yeah. back then. They literally used to get in something, they'd build themselves at home and then go, okay let's take to the skies and see what happens and yeah it was very very dangerous so Fantastic. we're a bit so, safer now <laughs> so what next then so what, what are we doing next so first thing we need to do is make sure we have our scales on quite a critical step put your wing mounted on your yogurt pot and cocktail stick concoction um, and then put your wind tunnel on top like Brilliant. so. And obviously the window's there so you can see the scales, exactly, isn't that right? Yes, yes. What so I might I do then is I, I might pop over while you're doing that. Come on, let's, let's, let's have a look. I'm going to get over on this side. And then actually we'll be able to see what the, the reading is down. for you. Yeah. Can you read that I, I can. It's on, it's on 18, I think, at the moment. Perfect. So we have yeah. our wind tunnel in there, ready and mounted. Okay. Hair dryer's plugged in, ready to go. And we should, hopefully... If it doesn't okay, fly, take off. It's not blown off yet. That's and it's good. gone down to 14, but it's turned sideways, so it's turned oh, sideways. No. So if we've got time, if we get a couple of little bits of blue tack. Yeah, we, yep. oh, yeah, we can. We, we can, can probably blue tack stick it down. that on, can't we? Let's, yes, uh, good point. Let's have a go at that. So if you, if you get trouble at home and the actual, the actual pot starts sliding around on your scales, just pop a couple of little bits of blue tack underneath your pot and that'll really keep it in place. And then obviously you'll get more of that kind of uh, lift going on and it's going to... So, there we go. we're so on. it might be slightly heavier now. Let me have a look. Uh, 17, eight, it's 18 still, 18. I think, so we're oh, okay there, yeah. I'm knocking Perfect. all the Lego all over the place here. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys, in the set. There we go, right, ready? Let's have a go, yeah. Oh, crikey, it's gone to zero. Wow, It's gone that's to zero, so it's, it's that much lift, it's trying to take off. It's literally, and then back to 18 again. That's amazing. 
But that is how the principle of flight works. So you can literally put anything on the toy Any airplanes, anything Yep, you, you can put your toy you? airplane in there, you can put a dinosaur in there, whatever you fancy putting in there and see if it gives you any lift. Fantastic. And you're using wind tunnels in your work to really test real parts of the aircraft, aren't you? Yes, we do, yeah. We put small parts of the aircraft in, we put models of the aircraft in, or if it's a really big tunnel, you could even put the whole aircraft in. Wow. We've put toys in there, we put Action Man in there, and he had his head blown off, no so way. who knows what you could put in your window. And that's what the grill's for at the other end, isn't it? it Catch is. any flying debris exactly, really stops yeah. it coming. I'm not yeah. too bad with the hairdryer, but... A real one goes a bit faster. Brilliant. So with these tips, I mean, obviously now we're going to be able to sort of see how far all these planes are going to go, but hopefully they're going to go a lot further now we've had some of this. So, Sophie, um, I think it's about time, really, that we did our major thing now so uh this is really all about the paper planes now now there are some rules i'm just going to quickly grab the rules and just let you know what they are so if you're going to take part in the paper plane challenge what you've really got to do is make sure you start with an a4 piece of paper that is really really important and uh, you're going to make your paper airplane you've got 60 seconds from the time it starts uh, until, the, until the end of when you, you finish making it. And then you, you, you've got to throw it, you've got to measure the distance, and we need a video of you throwing it. One continuous video from where you start the throw to where it ends, and then show the distance. And then you can submit that through our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, using hashtag engineering open house day paper plane. And obviously include the child's name and age as we have three prizes up for grabs today for different age categories. So that's five to seven, eight to 10, and 11 to 13. Once we've received your submission on social media, you'll be added to our leaderboard, which is here. And we might, um, you know, we'll be able to add you in and put all the different times, uh, different lens, times, that'd be weird, different lens. And so remember to get yourself up here with our engineering experts. Terms and conditions apply, so please do head over to our website before you join in. So let's have a quick go at uh, practicing what you've preached then, Sophie. Um, so hang on, I need to get myself ready as the paper plane adjudicator. We're live here in the studio, so you're going to see me leaving things all over the place, dashing around. It's going to be mad. Um, but I've got my, I've got my lab coat. Uh, I think it's a janitor's coat, really, but it's, 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 it's sort of thing. We've got the official measurer, the line of the paper, and we've got the whistle and the stopwatch. So... Have you got any, are you, are you got some tactics this you've been practicing? I have been practicing, but I'm notoriously bad at this. Really? So I'm not sure how this is going to go, but we'll give it a go. That's any what colleagues about. giving you any top tips? Uh, yes. Do you want to I name have, them and shame yes. them now before you start? No, I'll be, I'll be nice and I won't <laughs> name and shame them. But I've, I've been told two, two top tips. One is to make sure your mass balance is correct, so you've not got too heavy a front and you've not got too heavy a butt as well. That's important. Right. Everybody wants a heavy butt. Um, and then the other tip is to make sure you have a nice clean fold to make sure it's nice and tight. This isn't sounding good through. for my aeroplane, to be honest <laughs> now. Um, so, um, yeah. So, are we ready to have a go at this in the room? Are we ready? The very first paper plane <laughs> challenge of the day. So, I've got the stopwatch, the official whistle. We've got the measurer and we're ready to go. So, here we go. Oh, hang on. I've just started it. But you see, this you can tell it's live. My stopwatch <laughs> is gone already. Let me clear that off. Okay. Are we ready? In the studio. Three, two, one. And she's off, she's going. So, so you're just going for a straight fold over straight the middle fold. there. Yep. And is this going to be a dart style? Are we going for it? It looks like a dart it's style a dart to me. It's like one of those thinner ones. It is. Really nice, clean folds there. Thank you. We've got 12 seconds on the clock now. Perfect. And I'm going to fold it down. And this is to create a bit of weight this at the front. This is very interesting here. I haven't seen one of these. We've got 20 seconds there. There's no panic. Very calm, very calm here from so. Oh, this is an amazing looking thing. This is almost origami. You've got 30 seconds left, Sophie. 30 seconds. Mm. Hope I get it done in time. And she's really, she is absolutely smashing this. That is an amazing looking plane. I, this is this is 40 seconds. Are you going to do a bit of decoration if you get time? Oh gosh. If you've got some coloured pens at the end, if you've only got 15 seconds left. Actually going to put a bit Okay, we've got uh, coming up to on. 10 seconds. She's putting Ooh. all the little, what are they called? Stabilisers. Stabilisers, Okay, yeah. we're at nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one. Done. That's it. Have you done? I am done. Fantastic. Yes. Don't know how I'm going to throw it, but we'll see. Right. Well, this is going to be really exciting in the studio. If you come over to our white line over here, Sophie, you've got to stand here. Now, you can do a run up. Oh, I feel like that you would can, be very you bad. You can do a run up at home as well. <laughs> if you run up, you must let go of your paper aeroplane before Double. your feet go over the white line, okay? So okay. you can run up you could run up from the other end of the studio, but you must let go. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll have a DNF did not fly, okay? Oh, and that'll be on that. the board, all right? Oh, no. um, I've got to stand here in my position. We've got our favorite friend at the other end, India. She's going to put a little, <laughs> a little golf flag out where you're at. I mean, she's probably... You this might want to come a bit closer. Exactly. I was just like, thinking she might need to get far. a bit closer. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so where it's where it where it finishes. If it keeps sliding, 
That's the fine. That's it on the on the on the runway landing. Okay. okay? So are we ready then? No. Are you, so okay, <laughs> let's have a go. Then. So let's have a big clap here and a big. Let's give it the call. Three, two, one. Terrible. Look at that. Look at that. Like, that is why we don't play this game. <laughs> we needed the wind tunnel on that one, didn't I we? Did so we're going to stick it there. Do I need to measure this even? No, Sophie? I don't think you do. To um, be are you going to be able to go back to work? No. no you can't, you can't fall over as well. Come on, I can't <laughs> fall over as well. Um, let me just actually, do you know what? It's where the edge of it. We're going to give you an extra oh, thank five you for centimeters that. there. I appreciate at least. that generosity. Right. There you go. Um, right, so this is the official measure. Um, <laughs> It's about that far. I could just put about that far, couldn't I? Look, we'll get down. We're gonna we're gonna shine our little laser, a little laser beam on here somewhere there. It, oh no, there. One meter forty-three. As long as it beats a meter, I am happy. One meter forty-three. Right, we're gonna put you on the leaderboard. I mean, woo, big round of applause, big round. So Sophie, shall I put you know aeronautics no, engine? No, please don't. Please <laughs> uh, Okay, right, here we go. What was it? One meter, 43.9. There you go. That's beautiful. So one meter, 43.9. I mean, the great news is, is you are I'm technically at the first. top. You're technically first I'm at the moment. I'm going to take that. Well, <laughs> thank, you. No. thank you so much. Well, I mean, you did. I mean, it was a beautiful looking plane. I bet if you picked it up and had another go, it would go miles, to be honest. Um, so are you happy with that? Absolutely not, but I'm going to just let it be. <laughs> and what do you think could have gone better actually with it? I think that might have been my launch technique more than anything. Just a bit, bit shoddy, a bit shoddy. Well, currently first place, Sophie, but what, I mean, whether you'll <laughs> stay there, I don't know. Um, so I think there'll be a few people getting further than that. We had someone yesterday who came in, uh, who's our next president of the IET, Sir, Sir Julian, and he did 7.91 metres, yeah. but it didn't count because it wasn't officially part of the, of the uh, competition. Um, so I'm sure there'll be people at home beating you too, but thank you so That's much for great. joining us, Sophie. It was no brilliant having you in the studio, and we'll keep your, our eyes, and everybody at home, I'm sure, will keep their eyes peeled to see whether you make it as an astronaut in the future. That would be amazing. So we've, uh, we've seen how the amazing aircraft can fly, and we want to go even further up into the sky and out of this atmosphere, to be honest. So I'm going to whip this off now and quickly come back over here. Here we go. Uh, so um, in the last number of years, we have learned more about space than at any other time in history. We've had people go to space, and we've even stepped foot on the moon. And did you know the moon doesn't have any wind at all to blow around? So there's no wind there. And so that means none of the footprints get covered over and the tire tracks from the rovers that were there um, that were left by astronauts. So it's believed that those prints could stay there for millions of years. Imagine being able to say you have a footprint left on the moon. That would be incredible, wouldn't it? So to help us go back a bit in time, we're joined by Jack Hesselwood. Now, Jack is a rocket scientist who has worked on so many aerospace projects since he graduated from Kingston University in 2012. And he's also, would you believe, the current Mr. World, which is amazing. Woo! Thank you. And that's, that's, that's the largest male pageant in the world where he had to compete in charity fundraising, sport, fitness, modeling and talent. So welcome, Absolutely. Jack. Thank you for coming in. Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure. Excellent. Well, you know, one of the things we've got to ask you is um, we want to know, everybody will be asking now, you're Mr. World. That's right. How on earth did that come about? So this, this is a, um, a way of, uh, so basically it's, it's a, a beauty pageant, but what they do is they look for people who are very well-rounded. So I, um, I'm very big on science. I love science. I love playing, I play drums. I'm a big musician. Uh, I love sports, so it was a, a way of a competition where you, you do so many different things and they judge you based on, uh, on those things. So I am the first um, British person to win the competition since it was founded. So, uh, so uh, it's coming home. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's, that's really, and um, what the Mr. World, uh, what it actually means to be Mr. World is that I can spread the the word of science to uh, pretty much people all over the world. Fantastic. And, and brilliant. We could have you in here today then. Yeah, it's a Fantastic. pleasure. So you just said that you were, you were big on like music and drums. And it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? A lot of people who are engineers, mathematicians, scientists seem to be very good at music as well. Is, is there something that correlates between those things? Well, there is, um, there is a lot of theory that goes into music and there is a lot of mathematics that is at play when you hear something that sounds good it's actually, there is a mathematical way of explaining how or why it sounds good to your ear. 
Um, and there's uh, with drums, it's a lot about rhythm. So it's you know you need to keep time. There are bars and there's there's structure in music. So it could be as technical or as creative as you like. So that's why it's such a popular popular thing. But brilliant. Now you're you're into space in a big way, aren't you? You love everything to do with space. So let's start with, for our viewers at home, really, where does space start? And yeah. where does sort of the atmosphere finish? Because there's all sorts of discussions about that. But where, yeah. where's the kind of line drawn? Absolutely. Well, you say I'm into space, but Mark, what would you say if I was to say that we are actually in space right now? Really? So the only real difference between, as we're sat here now, able to breathe and outer space is our atmosphere. So that is the only thing that actually separates us from outer space. And the atmosphere really doesn't have a definite edge. So it just gets progressively thinner the higher up you go. And NASA have defined this as 100 kilometers, which is 60 or 62 miles. So as soon as you get to that point, NASA have said, you know, that's outer space. You know, there's not enough air to breathe. You're in a vacuum. Uh, you know, we can send satellites to orbit around the planet, um, around the Earth, around, um, uh, and send them into space. Um, and it's actually shown on this picture here, uh, which was exceeded just, um, I think it was this week, wasn't it, that Blue Origin um, actually exceeded that by five kilometers. So they went higher than that line, vertically upwards. Um, and then previously, Richard Branson in Virgin Galactic did the same. He didn't quite reach that 100 kilometers, mm. but that's what I want to talk to you now about because it really depends on um, what you're trying to achieve in space. Because if you are trying to uh, purely just get into space, you would feel very much like you are in space way before that uh, 100 kilometer Kármán line, it's called. So uh, it's there are different reasons, and I want to get into, into those different reasons a little bit more detail um, in a second. Brilliant. So before we go into that, there's, there's loads and loads and loads of different types of rockets. We've seen Richard Branson's, which is more of a kind of little plane. We've seen yeah. rockets that are like Elon Musk's one, um, and, and, and then there's the NASA ones going back sort of over the years. How many types of spacecraft and different things, uh, you know, things that orbit are up there then? So there are many. Uh, there are actually over 250 different robotic spacecraft operating in space as we speak at, at, in history. So they can be a number of things. They can be a rover, which is designed to actually, uh, it's like a, a car that drives on the surface of uh, a, solid, a solid planet like Mars, the Mars rover. Or there can be uh, probes that are sent out into vast space to go and uh, they, they do flybys of different planets, they measure, uh, they measure ra radiation, gravitational waves, they measure these big, um, they're called coronal mass ejections, these big, um, trying to describe it, it's like a, uh, almost like a firestorm that comes off of the, the surface of the sun, and so they can measure the density of those, and it gives us a lot of uh, interesting information about how the universe was formed, um, there are uh, landers, which purely would land uh, on an asteroid. I think there's actually a picture of um, the European Space Agency's lander, and it landed on an asteroid. Wow. Um, so you have, yeah, Mars, you have the Mars rover, for that's, example. That's a lot of stuff up there. I mean, so if we're putting all these things up there and all the satellites and everything else, I mean, eventually will it all come down? I mean, how, how do we get it all back down to Earth? So we do have that problem. So we have um, satellites that have been up into space for many years and they're orbiting uh, our planet and some of them have been, you know, finished their mission. They need to come back down now, but we need to, it's one of the challenges for uh, our current generation and the, uh, the next generation that are watching is to figure out ways that we can bring these back. So one of the convenient ways with satellites is that if you bring them back into the atmosphere, they're traveling at such a high speed that they will actually break apart. There'll be so much air friction because they hit the atmosphere. So they'll be orbiting, orbiting Earth. There'll be barely any air there. They can just move freely. They're traveling over 20,000 miles per hour. Wow. So as soon, if you were to bring them back into the atmosphere, they would burn up and they would be burnt up way before they hit the, uh, hit the ground. But we also have other issues uh, around, around that that really need to be addressed because it's not always as convenient just to burn them up in our atmosphere. 
Wow. And, and you studied uh, to become a rocket engineer, didn't you? Is that right? An aerospace engineer. An aerospace yeah. engineer. And, and is rocket engineering your favourite area of that? Or you, you, what sort of area of aerospace engineering are you, are you into? Well, I'm interested in, the whole, in everything to do with space. Um, but I really like the, uh, the design of rocket propulsion. Right. So I like the actually designing the, uh, the rocket engines. And um, it involves lots of different elements of science. But it's also the other areas like, I mean, it's not just... Um, it's not just aerospace engineers that work in the aerospace industry. You have, uh, you have uh, astrobiologists. That, what they do is they will look at um, different samples of rock that have been drilled and collected on the surface of Mars or the moon. Wow. Uh, they will be able to see if it's possible to live on Mars. Uh, and we've actually seen that from uh, a few space missions recently that it was possible in the past that Mars actually uh, was a habitable planet for a species like ours that needed water. Um, uh, so th that's really my, my main focus is the, is the propulsion side. That's my favorite part. And, and some of us, and, and, and a lot of the viewers at home, might not be massively interested in science, um, but, but could still love space. So is there a way you can still work in aerospace but not necessarily be a scientist? Yes. Yes. Wow. So you don't need to be um, a rocket scientist necessarily to work in space. So, I mean, we, we always need to recruit people to come and work in space. We need to uh, market it and spread the word of what the, uh, what's happening in space. And uh, we need to try and um, get people to support it, wealthy investors and governments to support it. So there are still other things that you can do in the space industry if you love it that much that you want to work in it, but aren't necessarily uh, or your maths and science aren't your strongest subjects at school well as we've got another aerospace engineer and obviously quite knowledgeable about how things fly we're going to test your engineering skills do you think you're up for the challenge of our paper plane challenge we'll, we'll see we'll see excellent so jack why didn't you make your way okay. over to our experts area and Pressure. we'll get 60 seconds on the clock <laughs> Remember, okay. you can use all the materials you have over there as long as it's an A4 piece of paper, but you can use pens and just you can't use any paper clips or blue tuck or anything like that. All of this um, stuff, yeah. And if you want to add decoration, you can certainly go to it. Um, so I've got the coat on again. I'm ready to go. I've got okay. my stopwatch at the ready. Let me just clear all that up. I've got my whistle. I've got my measure. Got whistle. And uh, hopefully you're ready. So you've got to. And just, we can use all the things on here. You can use anything on there as long as it's just a piece of A4 paper. Okay, brilliant. Okay, but you can colour in. You can colour in as I'll long use as colours. You, yeah, there's colouring pens over there if you get time. <coughs> so here we go. Uh, in the studio, let's <coughs> count in. If I can get everyone. Let's count Jack in. Here we go. So in five, four, three, two, one, go! Let's go. Oh, that didn't go so well, did it? My, my peas stopped rattling. Right. Uh, you're, going for, you're going for one of these little dark ones here. So we're currently at 10 seconds there. You've only got 60. You don't look very rushed at this. Have you been, have you been practicing as well? I have um, not been practicing, okay, but I'm going good. with um, the now, classic, Sophie, yeah, the classic Sophie's style. Sophie's distance, by the way, is 1 meter 43. Are you confident? Um, that's how they usually end up when I do it in my Just nieces. there, look, just there. So you've got 30 <laughs> seconds left, 30 okay. seconds left. You've gone for the full dart system here, haven't you? The full dart. The full dart. This is going to be fantastic. Gonna, 20 gonna... seconds on my clock coming. To <coughs> 20 seconds left. Ah, so this is this Mr. So World. He should be able to do quite a good throw, I would have thought. Ooh. But, um, yeah. It's not this, even. This, I mean, you know. Here we go. Eight, seven, six. Five, okay. four, three, two, one. Okay, stop building. Right, let's have a look. That's a, that's a darty dark kind of thing, right? Well, if you bring like your, your effort round through over let's, to the white line here. Let's see. <coughs> that was Sophie there. That's how they, that's what, that, that's what usually happens. They usually end up about that. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, this, this, so you can do a run up, and we've explained this so you can run up as long as your feet. Do you think the run up would help? I have no idea. I mean, it's, uh, I've just, I've just, this is just the rules. Um, but uh, <laughs> if you run up, you can't put your foot over and then throw because that okay. would be a DNF, did not fly, did and not that's fly. not what Mr. World wants. We don't okay. want that. All right, then. So are we ready, guys? Let's count him in. Three, two, one, go! Oh, that is Ooh. pretty expensive. 
Thanks. That's exceptional. Oh. Well done, mate. That's brilliant. Cheers, Mark. So that has gone That's a great. long way. I think we need to ride. Well, let's get the measure again. Okay, here we go now. I think Sophie's might be in the way. We're going to have to come over this side a bit here. So Sophie's is blocking the, the tape measure. Here we go. So, oh, it's a long way. It's quite 6.756 meters. I'm happy. That is brilliant. Well, <coughs> Mr. World knocked it out of the universe there. <laughs> Little joke for you. Uh, right, let's get a tag. I'm glad there's people at the back laughing. That's brilliant. Uh, uh, so we're going to put Jack. Mr. World, obviously. Uh, here we go. And we're going with weather. a 6 metres, 75.6. I mean, that's incredible. Right, so uh, uh, it's the first one who's having to slide down already. Sorry. I think we might put Sophie down here. Sorry. <laughs> Could get in trouble for that. But we'll leave Sophie down there and we'll put Jack up here. Well, that's fantastic. Well, what a great flight. I mean... Did you do anything different than a normal dart there? Had you been practicing something special? How did you get that to go that far? I was going to explain what I was doing as I was designing it, but I thought if I was to throw it and it was to just dive and go backwards, it wouldn't really help. Um, I went for a dihedral um, wing design, <laughs> which means that the wings are pointing slightly down. So if you just tilt your wings a little bit down, it will help it go straight Was that down. in the fold then? You put them down a little bit? It's all in the fold, Mark. Oh, it's wow. It's all in the fold. You want, your, you want your wings just to be going slightly down like that. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, it, it certainly works. So you're currently first on the leaderboard uh, with uh, Sophie Harker in second place. And we've moved her down a little bit just to make room, really. Um, but who will finish as the Engineering Open House Day winner? And remember to get yourselves up here on our leaderboard, too, with our engineering experts. All you need to do is to send in your video on social media using the hashtag Engineering Open House Day paper plane. And you could be in with a chance of winning a really cool stand prize. Terms and conditions apply, so please head to our website before you join in. But thank you so much for joining us, Jack. Thank it's you, been Mark. an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, big round of applause. He's an incredible guy, big difference maker in the STEM world. So we're delighted to be featuring Jack in our groundbreaking movement, Difference Makers campaigns later in the year. So watch this space. And I'm just loving this challenge of the paper planes. And to be honest, I will be having a go later. I haven't been practicing. So this is, I mean, Sophie's won't be at the end. But anyway, um, let's see how you're getting it on at home then, uh, if we've got any social media. So there's some social media stuff coming in. I'm just going to dump that down over here, run back over here. Oh, and this one's from Greg Foot. Look, it's from Greg. It's hashtag IET Open House with the IET. There's one from Joff here. Uh, James and Jenny and Dad would like to know if it's possible to steer a hot air balloon. Oh, we could ask that later, couldn't we? So that's fantastic. Oh, and there's one more coming in as well. This one is from Aerospace Bristol. Uh, it's on YouTube Live now, taking behind the scenes. If you missed the live premiere, the video will remain on our channel to enjoy later. So there you go. You can go and have a look at Aerospace Bristol as well. And it's great to see so many people enjoying our virtual rocket building session this morning. And that's from a fantastic, I think it's from Renish Edu. Yes, Renish Education, that's it. Well, wow, what a start to Engineering Open House Day. They say time flies. And when you're having this much fun, it really does. And obviously, this is is going to be a live a fun and a half we've still got about another gosh i don't know four and a bit hours or something left but i think all these rocket ships and supersonic paper planes how are you enjoying the show so far let us know i want to say hello to a few of viewers at home as well so just send us in all your thoughts just send us in any shout outs you want to IEC open house on social media and we'll give you a special shout out now, remember to visit the Media Hub where any of the virtual activities and live events that are happening from over 30 organizations all over the UK. If you want to learn more about the world of aviation and rockets, we have Synoptics who are showing you how to make your very own stomp rocket at home. Or hear from Discovery Engineers who help maintain the collection at Shuttleworth. And what a great place that is. So make sure you head there too. But if you want to keep tuned into our live show, all the events that we're talking about there will be available on demand after today so you can watch them at your leisure now we're taking on a different type of technical challenge and joining bake-off finalist andrew smith as he blends baking and engineering andrew studied engineering at the university of cambridge and for the last several years he's been working at rolls royce where he researches future aircraft concepts we were lucky enough to film him in our very own Savoy Place kitchens, showing us what happens when a baker meets an engineer. So join us in our electrical episode after Andrew demonstrates how astronauts safely return from the atmosphere with a retro dessert. 
Today, I'm looking at aerospace engineering, particularly what links safely returning astronauts from the atmosphere to a retro dessert. It's all about managing heat in re-entry. Now, re-entry is one of the most intense things a human can experience. Forces of up to 5G were decelerating from about 18,000 miles per hour. NASA astronaut Doug Wheelock described it as like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, but the barrel's on fire. That kind of gives you an impression of how vivid the experience is. And it generates an incredible amount of heat, both through compression of the air just in front of the spacecraft and through friction, it generates temperatures of up to 1800 degrees C. So how do we keep our astronauts safe? What are the strategies we can use? Well, there are three main things. The first one is the choice of shape of our spacecraft. So we can either go for a long and slender, which you might think is intuitive, or something a bit more blunt. And what NASA researchers find out is if you go for something long and slender, what actually happens is it overheats because as you compress the atmosphere as it comes back in, it overheats a very small area and it can melt or destroy your spacecraft. So what they actually find, which is not very intuitive for aircraft on Earth, is that you actually want to be as wide as possible. So if you're coming in with a very blunt surface, for twice the area, you get half the heat loading. So being bigger really is better. That's why the space shuttle launches vertically, comes back in on its belly. It's why the Apollo capsule comes in with a wide surface area. So that's the first thing we can do. Second thing is we can just decide to burn off some of the material on the outside. This is what we call an ablative heat shield and is what was used on the Apollo missions. So what's a good baking illustration for an ablative heat shield? Well, you can blow torch a ginger nut. It's a bit crude, does the job. Let's go and have a look. So if I pop a ginger nut there, and hopefully you'll see when I torch it, it starts to give off a bit of a flame and releases some gas. Now, what you can see is the surface looks a little bit mottled as we've started to burn it off. And that actually acts as a cushion, or what we call a bow shock, in front of the uh, spacecraft coming back in and helps keep the surface cool. So that's the second thing, ablative. What's the third thing you can do? Well, you have to insulate the rest. And we can actually use air as an insulator because when air is in pockets, it's incredibly good at being an insulator, similar to your duvet or double glazing. I've actually got over here a tile from the Russian space shuttle. This was the Buran and it's about 95% air by volume and it's incredibly light. And I could blowtorch the top of this and I could safely hold the bottom I could blowtorch the entire top of this and just hold the bottom for 10, 15 minutes. It's just an incredibly good insulator and it uses silica. But we can make an edible version of this as well to illustrate the same principle. And that's where a baked Alaska comes in using meringue. So we're going to make a Swiss meringue to start with. And a Swiss meringue is just heated over a bain-marie until it gets to 72 degrees C. So I've cleaned out a bowl here with some lemon juice and I've got 130 grams of granulated sugar. And I've also got three large egg whites that I'm going to pour in as well. And then I'm going to pop on my hob until it's simmering. I'm just going to whisk this over the heat with the digital thermometer until it gets to 72 degrees C. So I've got my egg whites and my granulated sugar in there and I'm just going to pop it over some simmering water. And I'm just going to whisk it continuously. Now the key with the Swiss meringue is you need to keep it moving and I want to bring it up to 72 degrees C. So I'm going to use the digital thermometer to check and that stabilizes the eggs and also ensures that it's safe to eat. Now the other bits of a baked Alaska are a sponge base, which I've prepared already. I've got a hazelnut and lemon sponge. And then I've got some ice cream, which I've cast into a dome, which is going to go on top. And the idea is that the meringue is going to insulate the ice cream from the intense heat of my blue torch. Okay, so once that's hit 72, immediately take that off the hob, straight into the stand mixer and pop it on a high speed for about three to five minutes until the bowl is cool to the touch and uh, it's at nice stiff peaks. Cool, so the bowl's completely cool to the touch. My uh, whisk stands in the middle, stiff peaks, and of course, the test for all time, stiff peaks. So. Meringue is ready, sit to one side. I've got my sponge over here, which is going to be my base. 
And then I've just taken my ice cream out of the freezer. So I just froze it in three different layers, three different flavors, uh, just for a bit of interest. And I just need to get it out of the mold. So once you've got your, your dome of ice cream, and I just put some cling film on that, then you're going to carefully pop it on top of your sponge base. Make sure it's nice and aligned. And then pretty quickly, you're going to want to get your meringue on top. So get your meringue. I've got a small offset palette knife just to smooth this. And you can afford to um, dollop quite generously. Look at that. And that just goes on top. If you're going for a statement cake, you could just blowtorch that as is. <laughs> but I'm going to put a whole layer on. So just dollop it nice and high before smoothing it down the sides. And when it's blow torched, it's going to be amazing. The Buran tile that I was showing you is about 95% air by volume. Meringue is about 80%. So it's not quite as light, but it's not too far away. And meringue is a really good insulator. If you put a dollop of this in the freezer, when you taste it, it will taste warm. It won't taste cold. And that's the same reason why if you step out of bed in the morning and you step on the carpet, it feels warm. But if you step on a tiled floor, it feels cold. And that's what the meringue's doing to your tongue as well. If you try it straight from the freezer, you're tasting lots of little insulated pockets. So it doesn't taste as cold as, say, an ice cube would. So the centre of that blowtorch is at about 1800 degrees. We're caramelising the meringue instantly. But it's only the very, very outside layer of this. And I've actually blowtorched one of these to destruction for about 10 minutes. It starts to smell pretty bad, but it still protects the ice cream on the inside. But we've got to do the test. We've got to cut in and see if it's done its job. So we're going to go in for a slice, see if it's worked. Ooh. In the moment of truth. Ho ho ho! There it is. A slice of baked Alaska and all the ice cream still rock hard in the middle. And interestingly, the meringue, it's only about three times worse an insulator than uh, a space shuttle tile. So uh, if you do happen to be in orbit, make sure you bring some spare egg whites with you because the Baked Alaska might just save your skin. Hi, I'm David Lakin, Head of Education and Safeguarding at the IET. Now I'm responsible for all of our STEM education programmes initiatives, including Faraday Challenge Days and First Lego League. Now we all know how important it is to inspire the next generation. STEM education is really important for all young people, no matter what their background. And at the moment, there's a lot of misperceptions about what STEM education can do for young people and the engineering careers they can go on to. So we have a big job to do to change those perceptions. Not only with teachers teaching those subjects, the students themselves, but also their parents. So we do this through running our programmes such as Faraday Challenge Days and IET First Lego League. Now these programmes aren't just about developing STEM skills or engineering problem solving, they're also about developing their soft skills, their employability skills, which are really important and will help them as they progress into their career. Now having a gender balance is also really important. At the moment for both Faraday and First Lego League we have around about a 50-50 split, which is brilliant, but we need to keep that going to make sure that we encourage all people to consider STEM subjects and go on to a career in engineering, no matter what their gender, no matter what their background. In order for us to be able to continue to develop and deliver these programmes, funding is really important. It allows us to grow the programmes to provide more opportunities for young people to get involved in these initiatives and learn and develop and hopefully be inspired to continue on their journey of studying STEM subjects and go on into a career in engineering. So it is vital that we have continued support to allow us to deliver programmes like Faraday and First Lego League. And your support is vital 
to allow us to be able to do that because providing these opportunities for young people to inspire them is life changing for those individuals and together we can continue to inspire more young people to go on into engineering and be the engineers and technicians of the future. Thank you for your support.